Good morning, everyone. For today's lecture, we're going to see uh, object detection using uh, well, RCNN and YOLO. So let's just, of course, again, I'm going to repeat this. This lecture is not going to be part of your uh, midterm. So I'm going to try to be very short. I'm not going to go to a lot of detail. I'm just going to make it uh, more of a, like, a theoretical and easy to understand uh, lecture and uh, basically give you some time to focus on uh, asking questions about the previous content and preparing for the quiz. Body doesn't get water. <laughs> So I think we should we should get started by now. But so uh, today we will not have a quiz again. So uh, well, in hopes that you guys would be able to focus more on the uh, midterm, and also because some students said they were kind of sick and couldn't join, and others had the conference, so I didn't want to uh, you know do the quiz when they couldn't join. For today's lecture, we're going to speak about uh, first. Are we recording? Nice. Okay, so we're going to speak about uh, object detection in general, and specifically about two of the most famous trees, let's say, of uh, object detection, which is the RCNN family, and of course, the YOLO family. Uh, is there anybody here who's familiar already with uh, what RCNN or YOLO is, who had at least like tried it, not maybe theoretical, but that is just have like uh, tried using these two architectures? Uh, I tried to use YOLO before. And nice. Was, yeah. was it an easy task? Uh, somehow, because I used the ready template. Oh, OK, but, good. Uh, it wouldn't be easy if I am training it from scratch. Yeah, of course, certainly. Nice. So here, what we're going to cover is basically just some theory about object detection. And then we're going to check out all the different RCNN uh, versions. So there is RCNN, fast RCNN, and faster RCNN. And then we will speak about, uh, of course, YOLO and Detectron. So Detectron is, uh, well, if you have at least tried to do some basic object det detection task, 
uh, detectron should all should be like your first option, right? So it's the fastest and uh, the easiest to use. So uh, RCNNs is just a name called region-based convolutional neural networks, and the name already describes the whole algorithm, right? So uh, hopefully I would let you guys uh, describe this algorithm once we get to it. So I'm going to be listening to your, um, let's say, uh, suggestions on how do we build an object detection model. So first, let's understand the difference between image classification and object detection. I'm sure you already are familiar with both. So for image classification, only thing we care about is the existence of this category or this class in the image. We don't really care where it is or what pixels exactly represent this class. And of course, for object detection, uh, well, there are cases when we're working with multiple objects in the same image. This is the most common case. And of course, there are cases where you work only with one object per image. Certainly here, what we're interested in is to find basically the smallest, uh, let's call it the rectangle, that fits the uh, object uh, well, right? So for example, for the class cat, here we have two of them. We should have like two labels cat, and it should give us two boxes. Each box is the smallest possible box that kind of wraps around uh, the cat. Its application areas are quite endless. So for example, we could take vehicle counting. Uh, can you guys see the, the video? Yes. Yes. Nice. So the simple task is basically they are creating or they are annotating, not annotating, they're detecting cars. And basically once the center of a car crosses this line, this line is basically something that is manually added, of course. Once it does, you see the counter, it increases. Once they cross this way, the counter increases. Same. And there you go, very simple application of, uh, uh, what is it called? car counting or vehicle counting. You could potentially do the same thing for uh, uh, people counting, right? But uh, sadly, it's a bit uh, more difficult since uh, human beings are kind of crowded all the time, right? Nice. The second application area, which is something that we're going to take a deeper look at uh, in the next uh, lecture, which is facial detection and facial recognition, right? Before we apply any facial recognition part or algorithm, we must always start with the detection of the face itself, right? So we're trying to find, again, the smallest rectangle that fits around the face. And basically it would give you the smallest image that could be sent to a facial recognition algorithm. Another application is the parking lot monitoring, uh, what is it called, yeah, system. And uh, for this one, we could potentially do it during the lecture, but just to show you guys how easy this is, uh, we already have a good data set with these kinds of images. And we can actually build a, either a YOLO version or something with RCNN uh, quite quickly and uh, get these results in in less than five minutes. So one person would tell me the easiest way to do uh, object detection is to apply right, a classifier on different parts of the image. So this is the uh, basic, what is it called? Sorry. This is the basic, uh, let's stop. Yeah, this is the basic, uh, object detection model that you could think of, right? Just a sliding 2D CNN classifier. And this model actually works pretty well, right? Uh, let's imagine, for example, 
Do you have a face here? And you're trying to do some facial recognition, right? And another face in here, for example, or facial detection. An algorithm that slides like this through the data or through the image will certainly not find anything interesting in this area, nothing interesting in this area. Once it gets here, it's going to like uh, throw a positive signal, right? And same thing would happen here. Now, one main question is, what is the move or what is the stride of this operation, of this sliding operation? And the second one would be, what is the size of this window, right? So of course, if we had a face like this big, already the face was occupying a big part of the image. And here, for example, uh, we have a small, smaller window size. This algorithm would certainly not work. But uh, how would you guys would solve this problem? Of not knowing what uh, window size to use. Use multiple ones. Use multiple ones. I like this idea. Anyone else has any other thoughts? There's something. Mm -hmm. So let's see. Also resizing, like using the pyramid idea from previous lectures. Yes. Which is kind of using the different sizes, right? It just turns out to be the same thing. Either you make the image smaller with the same size of the, uh, the window, or you make the window bigger for the same size of the image, right? Now, this is a very, very good idea. So what would you say, like uh, a good potential shape for this window should be, right? Should it always be rectangular, right? So we're going to use multiple like this. Should it always be like this or should we maybe include different shapes? Let's say I'm Let looking for a cat, right? So for example, shape. the cat is sleeping like this. Sorry, what did you say? Probably yes, include different shapes. Yeah, probably including different shapes. Since we're going to do with this operation anyway, right? We're going to include multiple windows. We could do something like this, right? So these are like three different uh, boxes that could uh, potentially be more useful than just one shape or one rectangular shape. But again, this is pretty useful, as we said. So it could detect like a cat that is sleeping like this, or I don't know, like uh, if we are interested in a stop sign, so it could certainly detect it when it's, uh, well, horizontally uh, laden like this. And it uh, would be uh, nice also to have, as we said in the first, multiple scales of the sizes, right? So let's say this first rectangle and this one and this one with smaller size. And then we make the same kind of ratios like this, but with much larger size. Then we do it again and again and again. So this should be already a good enough model that could recognize objects in different scales, different uh, ratios or different orientations, right? If they're like horizontally or they are uh, vertically uh, lane or even if they are just like uh, squared, right? So this is an algorithm that works pretty well. Now, there is one small problem uh, with this algorithm is that it doesn't work pretty fast, right? So as your friend has suggested, we could potentially use some idea like the pyramid idea, 
where we uh, speed up the, the search a little bit more. So the pyramid idea is pretty simple. You start working with an image that is super small. So you, uh, what is it called? Subsample, yeah, you subsample from this large image into like a very, very tiny image. On this tiny image, you're going to do your sliding classification. And only do further research on its bigger version in the areas of interest. So let's say while working, for example, on this one, so this was the original image, or this was the smallest image that we have. Okay, I zoomed in on it. And this was like the area where we had multiple, uh, what are they called? Activations of the classifier, right? The classifier said there is a lot of work here. So what we do is simply, we zoom back in, right? You can't zoom in. So what we do is simply we zoom or we uh, again go to the higher space of this image, but instead of sliding through this bigger image, we slide only on this region. So we make the region even smaller. And once we zoom in, so this becomes the, uh, the new image, right? So once we zoom in, the activations get uh, more precise Right, so let's say the activations are in this area. What we do is we go to the next uh, size or the bigger size, and again, only search in this area. Same thing for the larger and larger and larger and larger until we arrive to the original size of the image. Nice. Excuse me one second. Sorry, guys, something got into my mind. But yeah, so this was like a tiny improvement speed of our algorithm which is basically starting from very, very small size of the image, doing the sliding in here, finding the locations that interest us inside a small image, and then going back up in this original to the original sizes of the image with more uh, focused, basically, areas of search. This certainly solves the problem of what is the stride size, right? So previously we were uh, like, we had this question of what should we use for the stride of the work? If we do the, uh, just one pixel. So for example, we work like this, we start in here. And then the next one is just like a pixel away from it. And then the next one is also a pixel away from it. And then just one moving one pixel at a time. You can certainly see that this algorithm would take uh, hours and hours to finish. But if we do this same task, but on the lower, uh, lower side image, right? So this is basically, let's say, a uh, 32 by 32 image. And then we just keep on walking on it pixel by pixel, even with a stride of one, we're still able to you know, finish this in time, right? So it's not gonna be a very time consuming task. And then later on, once we zoom in again, we have a more or much smaller image size, making it even like, making it also like uh, pretty easy to do the stride of one in each direction. Another one would be to use the selective search algorithm. So selective search algorithm is a pretty simple algorithm. We're not gonna go into much detail because it's not really uh, currently much used anymore. So it was like an initial idea and then it disappeared. But technically what it does is it takes the image. Uh, we spoke about super pixeling or 
not in this course. Probably not in this course. Uh, not in this course, okay, so it's probably for the master's guys. Yeah, anyway, so basically what we will do is we certainly had some sort of uh, clustering for images. No, not really, we didn't do that, okay. That's cool. So let's imagine that we have like, uh, this is the sky. This is, let's say the sea. Uh, this is uh, the sun, right? And uh, yeah, this is the sea, so it should be blue, sorry. And uh, this is, let's say the sky should be kind of white. Yeah, so this is just the colors. If we use some sort of a clustering technique, right, that uh, looks at uh, these different pixel intensities and tries to find some sort of uh, clusters well, everywhere. Uh, so let's say the sun, like this, yeah, here's the sun. So for example, in here in the sun, we can definitely see that the pixel intensities of most of the values that are inside the sun are very similar to each other. So we could group them into the same cluster and call it cluster object one. And then later we would see that, for example, the sky, there is a, uh, this is, uh, what is it called? Um, the things that float in the sky, this, Clouds. Yes. So let's say we have a cloud. And as you can see, the pixel intensities of the clouds are kind of similar to each other. So let's say we propose this part as an object. We go down to the road, for example, in this case in here, the road is a bit more complicated. So we could see that these parts are connected or are uh, similar in color. Again, the back of the uh, of the truck is similar in color. So what we do is we propose the front of the truck alone, we propose the back of the truck alone, and then once we see that there are objects, or once we see that there are clusters connected with each other, you remember guys what being a cluster connected with each other, uh, we just do it with those uh, connected labeling components, for example. And here what we do is we propose another, uh, another area where these two objects are merged. So this is what selective, selective search does, right? So selective search just looks at the image, tries to clusters uh, the values or the pixels based on their intensities. And then after the uh, initial like uh, clustering is done, you could just try to combine uh, different clusters with each other and propose a new object or send in different values, right? So here you can see we have a very small areas and then we have stuff which are very large. So this algorithm definitely would save you some time, right? So instead of applying a CNN on every single sub part of the image, we're applying a CNN only on the interesting parts of the image, right? So the interesting parts of the image means something that is uh, kind of the same, right? So the heuristic is an object would have the same pixel intensities everywhere or would have like two or three groups of pixel intensities, right? So for example, in this case, we have the first pixel intensities, which is the front of the car. And when we have the second part of the pixel intensities, which is like the back of the and this would be an object. Same thing for, uh, let's say, for a car or for a vehicle, right? The majority of its pixels would already be inside the same color of the car. So for example, if it's a black car, then the majority of the pixels of that car would be black. And this would allow you to propose that area for classification. So this selective search part that does not do object detection, it just do it just does the uh, let's say proposals of regions 
of interest. So this is the uh, goal of the selective search algorithm. It's a pretty basic algorithm. And uh, it works pretty well to simplify our work. Now, a small question would be, how good is this model, right? Is this a good model that works pretty well for us or not? And this is uh, the question that we will answer soon. But for, for now, can somebody tell me, how would you evaluate a classification model? Like the simplest way to do it. Or classification. It depends on the purpose that you uh, pursue. Evaluation, from. just basic evaluation of a classification algorithm. The simplest and dumbest one is accuracy. Yes, that's it. <laughs> yeah. It's the simplest form of evaluation and it kind of works, right? Of course, you would tell me it doesn't work with lots of classes and stuff, but for, for our purposes, it works pretty well, right? So we have accuracy. Now, this is how you evaluate, uh, what is it called? Uh, classification algorithm. How would you evaluate a regression algorithm? MSC. MSC. Now, uh, we already discussed this, I think, before. Could be in the other course, but is an object detection a classification task, a regression task, both, or none of these, uh, or, or none of them? So object detection as a black box. that takes an image and outputs the output of object detection. Is it a classification? Is it a regression? Um, like in, in a simplified way, it is class partially classify, classifying the objects because it outputs the objects with the labels and also regressing the, uh, the window of the object. Uh, like trying to get the window itself. It's like a regression thing. Mm -hmm. Like this is treating it as a black box. But meaning? Yeah, like this could be. Meaning that it can be both. It, yeah, it's basically both, exactly. How do we define this bounding box? Pretty simply. So if this is like, a, let's say an image, what we do is, we represent it using these two points, right? So these, if you have this point and this point, you can represent our uh, window in here. How do we represent these two points? Simply by their coordinates. So x, y, and here we have x and y, right? So basically, uh, the output of your uh, object detection looks like this. Here we have the class. Here we have x1, y1, right? And here we have the x2 and y2. And this is what the object of, uh, this is what the output of object classification would look like. So here we have the classification part. And here we have the regression part. Now, one way would be to evaluate this part separately using uh, accuracy and evaluate this part separately using MSE. Now we will take a look at like a, a more, let's say relevant, way of doing uh, object detection evaluation, right? So what we are trying to compare is not, in fact, it's not really like trying to say what's the similarity between 100, 200, 300, 30, let's say 300 and 400. So these are like coordinates that are correct. These are the real coordinates, let's say. 
and these are the uh, 110, 220, 290, and 390. And these are the predicted coordinates. So we could compare these values, value by value, or we could try to find a metric that is more suitable for this situation, right? So in our case, this was the original or the correct prediction. And this, uh, or the, yeah, the real prediction. And this is And this is our uh, well prediction. This is what the uh, algorithm gives. So this is prediction, and this is real box. Now, can somebody tell me a, a different way, or try to find a different way that kind of measures how similar these two are with each other? Uh, in the other course, we had uh, intersection over union. <laughs> so you already had the course, right? <laughs> no, the practical machine learning. Okay, that's bad. <laughs> I was hoping to like help, like uh, build our way to to this metric. But since you guys already know it, then uh, yeah, no need to make all the systems. So intersection over union, right? So it's pretty simple metric and uh, you guys are already familiar with it so uh, for you guys it should be the equivalent of what accuracy is for classification in, uh, in in classification but for object detection simply what we do is we take the intersection over two bounding boxes and we divide it by their union can somebody tell me why do we do this division by the union like the intersection alone is a very good metric, right? So if they have a high intersection, that means they are close to each other. And if they have a low intersection, that means they are far from each other. Because, because we can just predict the whole image and the intersection will always be 100%. Yeah, exactly. That's, uh, that's, uh, that's the point. And then the second point is we want a metric that is between zero and one. Right, so we want something that goes from zero is horrible, one is perfect. So can you find a value that is always bigger than intersection? And once the uh, both objects are very well merged together or very perfect uh, with each other, it should be equal to the intersection, right? So technically what we're, what we're trying to find is we're trying to find an upper bound for the intersection that gives us this ability to have the perfect value at one. So same value here is the same value here. And of course, whatever is in between should be between zero and one. And that's what the union gives us. So the union gives us first the ability to uh, take care of this problem. For example, this is the large box. This is the small box is included within it. So these boxes are certainly not the same. They're certainly not optimal, but still the intersection over you, uh, the intersection alone would give you a very good result, like top result. But the intersection over you wouldn't. And the second problem is just to give you something between zero and one. Very good. Now let's speak about uh, the final like uh, part or piece of information component of our uh, uh, analysis or our sm simple algorithm, which is non-maximum suppression. So I've already explained non-maximum suppression like uh, in, uh, in a few details uh, in the last few lectures, but can somebody just give me a small recap of what it is? Basically, we compare uh, multiple points in, in the neighborhood, and we only keep the one with the highest activation. 
Yeah, perfect, right? So again, remember when we were doing the Harris corner detection, right? Let's change the color like this. So when we were doing the Harris corner detector, uh, we had a R for every single pixel. And of course we had like very large activations, for example, here, very large activations all the way like this. So you could see that uh, these parts are quite, sorry, like this. Let's say, yeah, we had like lots of different subgroups around the image. So what we do is we take the same representation, but we only find the points with the highest activation, right? So basically at each window or each neighborhood, we keep only the maximum value. We're going to do something pretty similar here, but instead of like defining it in that way, let's do it in an algorithmic way. So the first step, find the or find the box with the highest, uh, what is it called? With the highest prediction accuracy or prediction, not like your probability, right? Prediction, probability. We take the one with the highest and then we calculate or we find the intersection over union between this box and all the other predictions, okay? So we have uh, our algorithm is going to walk around the image and uh, throws off some activations here some here, some predictions are here, some predictions are here. For example, around this area, certainly we're going to have multiple predictions, right? So let's say we had one in here, one in here, one in here, because they all contain different parts of the object. So they're all going to have like, uh, certainly they're all going to have some sort of activation. So what we do is we calculate the intersection of a union between this box and all the other boxes. If the intersection over union is bigger than a certain threshold, we remove those predictions. So let's say we have this one and we have something like this on top of it, very close to it. This is another prediction and they are both highly intersected, right? So they have a very huge intersection over union. So in this case, we remove the second box, just completely remove this prediction. And then we repeat this step again and again. So we take a look at the next uh, highest, of course, we, uh, we take this out, like uh, not take it into consideration. We take a look at the next uh, largest value or the next largest prediction probability, find its intersection over union with every single other box and remove anything that is bigger than a certain threshold repeat again and again and again until this is completely done. So this is like a small overview. Now here we are speaking more in terms of variables and uh, algorithmic manner. So in this way, we will have a small list of, uh, what is it called? Yeah, so we take the proposal with the highest confidence score and remove it from B. So B is the predictions list. We take the one with the highest prediction and remove it from B, we put it in D, which is the output of the model. This is the output of non-maximum suppression. This is the results. We take the one with the maximum values, we put it in D, and then we compare this proposal by calculating basically its intersection over union with every other proposal. If the intersection over union in this B is higher than a certain threshold, we just delete these elements, right? So now, for example, we have only three elements left. We repeat the same task of like taking the proposal with the highest confidence, we put it inside D, and then we remove everything from B that, that has basically a high intersection over union with this last item. And then we repeat again and again and again until B is empty. So this is what the uh, non-maximum suppression algorithm does. 
So, so far, our uh, cool uh, idea for object detection is a very simple one where we have like a pyramid like this. Let's okay. So it's like an inverse pyramid, right? Starting from the smallest, going to the biggest. And then we have multiple object windows of different shapes and, of course, of different sizes that will walk through the image or walk through the different scales of the image. And then we have the uh, non-maximum suppression algorithm, which will basically kind of uh, simplify or improve the, our results and uh, removes the objects which are highly overlapped. Because this is one of the weaknesses of our algorithm. Uh, it will throw a lot of activations around the same area. So using the non-maximum suppression algorithm, we're certainly going to uh, get this a bit better. Could I ask oh, a question? Yeah, go ahead. So the removing are the most similar to the one from G. Yes. Uh, because it is the same object, but what is remain after the whole algorithm in D? The, there are different objects, yes? Yes, yeah. Okay. Hopefully, right? So if you choose the correct threshold, hopefully you would have uh, only the bounding boxes of objects that are completely distinct from each other. But this is very risky, for example, if you're doing uh, uh, some sort of crowd detection or stuff like that, or some working in the crowds, uh, these cases tend to be very like, difficult to work with or find the threshold that works for all types of images. So again, non-maximum suppression is still very much used in every single object detection algorithm, but finding the right threshold takes a lot of time. So it's, it's highly dependent on the case where you're working in. So if you are working with something that's uh, basically a lot of crowding, or you're working with something where the objects are very well separated from each other, and this is the good, easy case where any threshold would do the job. Uh, so now let's like try to uh, sum up the two versions of algorithms that we have seen. So we always have two parts. We have the first part, which is the uh, region proposal, and the second part, which is the classification. Classification is easy. We have seen that. Now, the region proposal, we gave it two algorithms. The first algorithm was uh, basically sliding plus non-maximum suppression. And the second algorithm was selective search. So selective search is basically an algorithm that looks into the pixels of the image and proposes different regions that could look interesting. After that, we apply our classification on these different regions. And there you have it. You have an object detection algorithm. And in fact, this is like one of the uh, original uh, algorithms for uh, object detection, which is called RCNN. So regions with CNN features or region-based uh, convolutional neural networks, something like that. Anything uh, you, you can find it called different ways, right? Simply, you take the input image, you extract region proposals using selective search. So selective search is pretty uh, heavy. So it gives you like around 2,000 uh, regions. And then each one of these regions will be uh, wrapped or basically resized and sent through a CNN. And then classification later on was being done using, uh, in their algorithm was being done using SVM. But uh, for us, it doesn't really matter. We could just do the classification directly using uh, uh, fully connected neural networks. So this is what the algorithm does, right? So you take the image, find the region, the regions, of course, will have different shapes, different sizes. Uh, we do a question yes, about this particular one step. Uh, how we exactly extract regions with which algorithm? Yeah, uh, remember the selective search? 
We spoke about it like a couple of minutes ago. Ah, so this uh, neural network too? No, no. A selective search is a simple algorithm, like it's basic clustering algorithm that creates clusters from the pixel intensities. Remember when we said the sun contains pixels of similar intensities? So what we do is we cluster them together and propose this as a potential object, this as a region. Okay, but does it work well? <laughs> no, of course not. And this is why this is the first algorithm that we are looking at. We will speak about uh, its uh, performance in the next slide, but for now, just try to understand it like that. So here we have the uh, region proposal. The region proposal algorithm, as we said, is just a clustering technique uh, based on the uh, pixel values. And as you can see, for example, here, we can certainly see that these pixels look like uh, they have the same intensities. The face also has the same intensities and the hat also has uh, the same intensities. So here we can see that we have different parts and all of these three parts are kind of connected to, to each other, right? So the pixels in this place are connected to the pixels in this place, are connected to the pixel of this place. So we will propose this as a bounding box, this as a bounding box, this as a bounding box, and then of course the combination of both. So these two, these two, and then these three. So we will be proposing a lot of uh, objects, right? So around 2000 regions for every single image, right? So you can imagine how many of those we will have, but still it's a bit faster than uh, sliding through the image uh, one by one. And then what it does, we take uh, each one of these regions and we send them through the CNN and we do the classification. Very simple algorithm. Again, just like uh, for info, the classification in here was being done later on after the fully connected layers was being done with SVM. But for our case, we really don't need to understand or worry about why is it SVM or not. So for them, they said we used SVM, we used uh, basic neural networks and SVM after the neural network gave better results, but it shouldn't really influence the understanding. Now for selective search algorithm, just to give you guys like a better uh, understanding. So what we do is we generate initial sub segmentation. And then from that, we generate many candidate regions from that. After, after it, we use some greedy algorithm to recursively combine regions into larger ones and then use the generated regions to produce the final candidate region proposals. So what we do is we merge all the different parts of the image that are uh, similar in, uh, what are they called, in uh, intensities. And then from there, every two that are close to each other will propose something new. And then every two which are close to each other will propose something new. And we keep on repeating this merging iteratively. So using some sort of a greedy algorithm. So I'm sure you guys are already familiar with what greedy algorithms are. So we're just trying to optimize on some function or heuristic function. And then until we reach like the, uh, the place where we have merged everything together or we have merged enough that we should stop. And that all of these would be the proposed regions, right? So it's not gonna be just one or two regions. We're definitely gonna have something in the thousands. Is this a good idea or not? So first thing is training time is humongous, right? So it's very huge. 2000 classifications for every single image. So if you had for classification, for example, for ImageNet, let's say we had 1 million images. Now we have 1 million images. And for each image, we're going to do classification 2000 times. So certainly this is going to be uh, how many? 20 billion or 2 billion? Yeah, 2 billion classifications and that is a lot right so just to go one iteration over the data set we're going to have to do two billion uh, image classifications so the training time was 
crazy. The inference time is again also very crazy because we will have to do 2000 classifications on the same image, right? So basically we take the image, we propose 2000 regions, and then we do 2000 uh, image classifications on those 2000 regions. So that's also very large. And then the next part is the selective search algorithm is not data set specific, right? So the selective search algorithm, as we said, is just something that groups pixels together. That's it. Now, one problem with that is if you're going to apply it, let's say on pictures of animals, so real photos, and you apply it, for example, for scan detection or, or uh, what are they called? Uh, cancer detection, right? So this is like the heart, lungs and stuff. I don't know, the lungs. And here you have some cancer. So if you're going to do object detection for cancer here, the same algorithm that proposes the regions of cancer will be used to propose the face of a cat. And that's never a good thing, right? So if you're going to use the same algorithm without any training, without any fine tuning, without any changing in uh, its uh, performance, it's certainly not going to work for everything in the same way. So the selective search algorithm is certainly a big problem or a big drawback in the RCNN. The, uh, the next step would be to try and solve these two problems. So the first problem so far, we still don't have anything that can replace it. But this thing, the training time and the inference time certainly can be improved using a very simple trick, right? And I think you guys can find it uh, yourselves too. What happens when you take this image and send it through a CNN? Just through a convolutional layer. Can somebody tell me what happens with, to an image when you send it through a convolutional layer? We get activations. Nice, you get this feature map of activations, right? Something like this, sorry. Something like this, right? Mm -hmm. Can we find a way to basically map this area to the pixels that generated it? Um, Is it possible? We can, like we did with shift features, descriptors, this panorama. Uh, yes, and uh, no, no, not like uh, finding the features of importance and stuff, just like basic mathematical stuff, right? So just like with the index of this one, you go to the index uh, of this one, right? So just using the size of the kernel, let's say the kernel was three by three. So this pixel in the center was created using three by three pixels, right? So we just come to its location here and then take this, 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 right? So using a very simple uh, mathematical operation, we can easily map from what we have here to what we have here. So what the authors have said, why should we always have to uh, send every single small part of the image through the CNN where we could do something much simpler, send the whole image once through the CNN, right? So we have this whole image, we send it through the CNN and we get the activation feature map. So this is the activations feature map. The activations feature map would later on be sent for classification uh, yeah, for, for classification using fully connected layers, but that's for now uh, a later step. Once selective search gives you this area, for example, is the area of interest, you don't send it again through the CNN. The only thing you do is you find the mapping from this pixels 
to their corresponding location in the feature map, right? So these, this place of the feature map was generated from the pixels of this area. So if we use this, it's, it would be the same thing as if we send it through a separate CNN. Did you get the logic behind? Yeah, so we do this mapping for, uh, from the original image to the feature maps directly without having to send uh, every single region or every single proposal through the CNN. So this would speed up, simply this would speed up uh, the first operation of going through convolutional layers, right? Of course, later on, after we get the uh, mapped regions, we will send them all for classification. So we will have 2000 classifications, but we will not have 2000 passes over the uh, class or, or over the Siena. So just like a small recap of what we have seen so far before we move forward. So we have seen what object detection is, what it is, how it's related to uh, image classification and regression and stuff. We spoke about intersection over union, we spoke about non-maximum regression, and we spoke about RCNN, which is the first algorithm proposed for, uh, what are they called, for uh, object detection using selective search. Now, which we try to find basically an idea that could speed up this calculation, and the idea is pretty simple. Instead of sending the image, or instead of sending every single proposal through the CNN again and again and again, what we do is send the whole image through the CNN, get the activation feature map, which is an image. And of course, if we use like same padding, let's say we used uh, that uh, padding to give us the output equal to the same size, we could do directly a mapping from these uh, proposals or these region proposals to region proposals in the feature map. And hence, what is being sent for the classification is only this part for the object that goes through the fully connected, neuro, uh, fully connected layers. And then of course, softmax uh, for classification and bounding box regression for uh, basically regressing the bounding box coordinates. Now, of course, here you can see ROI pooling. We will speak about this later, but for now, does everybody understand the basic concept of what fast RCNN does? Again, simply, instead of sending every single region through the CNN from scratch, right? So for example, we send only this part through the CNN and then classify it. What we do is we send the whole image through the CNN. We get feature maps and from the feature maps, we take the selective search, find its mapping area, and then send it for classification. So this kind of reduces the number of times that we have to go through the CNN. So let's say previously we were doing 2000 passes through the CNN. Now we do only one pass through the CNN for all the image. And this is how we do, for example, the mapping of coordinates. So previously this object was uh, let's say, uh, yes, it was from 320, 128 to 300, 340, uh, 440. So this is the uh, center and this is the size. And it goes to an object here. This is the area or this is the location. Or the, yeah, this is, sorry, this is the center. Sorry, let's repeat. This was the size of the image. This is the size of the feature map, so it's much smaller. This is the center of the object in the original image. This becomes the center of the object 
in the smaller image, right? So basically what we do is we scale the image smaller. So let's say from 688 to go down to 430, uh, 43. This gives you like, I don't know, 10, let's say a 12 times smaller ratio. So what we do is we take the center, divide it by 12. There you go, you have the new center. Now we take the uh, width and height of the object in this case, divide them also by the same scale. And there you go, you have the size of the object here and you have the region proposal. So this is what will be sent for classification directly, right? So instead of sending it through the CNN again and again, we will send it once through uh, CNN for the whole image. Now, one problem arises. When we spoke about uh, here for selective search, we said it gives us the image, right? Here's the image, or it gives us the proposal. And then we do this wrapping before we send it through the CNN, or we kind of resize all the different shapes of regions into the same size. And then we send it through the CNN. But the problem is now we are not uh, sending every single one of them through the CNN. We're sending only the original image like this through the CNN. And then we do the mapping between this region and its location in the feature map. So if we go back here, this region, its shape would look like this. Whereas this region, its shape would look also like this, for example. But let's say the window, its shape would be rectangular. So they're not going to have the same sizes. They're not going to have the same shapes in here. And we cannot just do some resize over the original image, right? So we cannot do that. So what we do, what we simply can do, is apply something similar to resizing, but not for images, for feature maps. So this something similar for resizing for feature maps is called ROI pooling. So ROI pooling, again, looks very similar like max pooling. I'm sure you're all familiar with max pooling is, what, what max pooling is. Everybody knows what max pooling is? Anyone? Max pooling? No? Of course, everybody knows. Yeah, nice. So now, now that we have the max pooling, so simply we take an image like this, we give it a fixed size kernel, and we send it through the image. Our output will be smaller than the original image. And for every single pixel in here, for example, we only take the maximum of the values in this filter. Now, the difference between max pooling and ROI pooling is that we no longer have a fixed size window like this. What we do is we have something, let's say, let's, let's say we want to change an object from, from this size into something like this. And let's change a little bit the size of this one. Let's make it rectangular. One, two, three, one, two, one, two. So now what we do is we apply not like a two by two. So what we're trying to do is we're trying to map this into this output. So this is our input, and this is the shape of the output. We fix the output size, and we make the kernel moving. So the kernel, what would it look like? So this pixel, this pixel, this pixel. So this is two by two. And this is one, two, three. So this is three by one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, seven. Simply, we make the kernel size 
7 divided by 2 and 3 divided by 2. So this is, you would say, this is like uh, impossible. We cannot do that. So what we do is we make it, uh, uh, can you tell me 7 divided by 2? So it's uh, 3 and a half. And this is uh, 1 and a half. What we do is we have a kernel of different sizes. So the kernel would look something like this. Three pixels are grouped into the same one. So for example, in this direction, three pixels are grouped into the same. And here we have four pixels grouped into the same. Okay. So if we come back here, the first part here, let's draw it in green. So here what we do is the first one is one and a half. So we take one like this. So this is the separation. And here we have three and four. So when you have like something uh, in between, so three and a half and something, give the first one the small value and the next one the next one. So three and four. So this will give you the split of uh, ROI uh, pooling, you take the maximum of these three points or three pixels, put it here. You take the maximum of these six points, put it here. Take the maximum of these four points, put it here. Take the maximum of these eight points and put it here. And there you have it. So ROI pooling is a very simple technique that always has a fixed output size. So it does not have a fixed, uh, what is it called? Input size, neither does it have a fixed kernel size. Now it has a fixed output size. And then what you do is you find the regions for every single pixel in here, just by splitting. And uh, basically you do the max pooling or you do the maximum of over that regions and send it in this output pixel. So this is what ROI pooling is. So it's, let's call it like some sort of reshape, but instead of uh, just randomly taking any value in each region, we're taking the maximum value for every specific region of interest. And there we have it. This is ROI pooling. It solves our first, uh, our second problem, which is that the shape of these regions is not always the same in the feature maps. And then the rest is exactly the same as the previous algorithm. So we just take uh, this ROI pooling output, which is just normally a, a feature map, right? Of the same size, all of them. And then we flatten it, send it through fully connected layers, and then send it for classification. So the algorithm, again, what it does, takes an image, send the whole image through the CNN, get the feature map, and then using selective search, we have our regions, find the mapping to the feature maps, make all the feature maps of the same size using ROI pooling, and then send each one for classification. So here we have 2,000 classifications again, but this first part, we do it only once. Unlike for the RCNN, where we do the whole part 2,000 times. So we're definitely saving a lot of time. Could I ask a question? Yeah, of course, go ahead. Uh, could you show the architecture one more time? Yes. Yes, yeah, this one. Mm -hmm. uh, we apply fully connected layers on for each uh, region of interest, not for all, for the whole feature map set. Because it's unclear from the picture, but from you from what you said, I understood that we apply to each feature map fully connected layer and we classify each feature map. Each feature map. Okay, so what you're saying, each feature map could be a little bit uh, confusing, right? So remember the feature map looks like this, right? Not just uh, a matrix like this, but it's a 3D 
object. We don't care about the third dimension anymore, right? So all of these are different feature maps of the last layer. We consider them just feature map activa activation, right? We consider them all the same like this. And now we're only indexing on the X and Y. So when I say this feature map, I mean all of this, right? Is this the question? So are you asking about the different feature maps here? Or are you asking about the different feature maps of the different objects? Uh, different, each feature map of different objects. OK, so you're ignoring this. Uh, yes, completely ignore this uh, part, right? So imagine that we have only one feature map for each object, right? Just one matrix, one channel in the feature map. And here, we take our input image, not this. We take the whole input image, send it only once through the CNN. So we have one feature map for the whole image. After that, we apply the selective search algorithm. So this is selective search. It gave us this region, for example. We go to the map, to the image, and find its corresponding location. So let's say this is the corresponding location of this region in its feature map, right? So the calculation is done once. Let's, let's say this is another region. So we just find its corresponding location. This is object number one, object number two. Let's give it a different color. What we do is we resize this place into like this, and then we resize this one again into the same size like this. Let's use this color. OK? From here, each one of these will be sent through the same classifier. Is this clear? So are you saying uh, here you see this ROI projection, and you're thinking maybe uh, is ROI pooling applied uh, after or before? Is this what you're saying? Uh, no, but now I understand that we uh, apply uh, searching on the feature map that we, one feature map that we got after. No, 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 no. So you're saying we do selective search on the feature map? What, from you said, I understood it like this, I'm sorry. <laughs> yes, 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 this is, thank you so, so much for, uh, for saying this. No, this is very, very important. The selective search is happening on the original image. Selective search happens here. We finish the search. We take the proposal and map the proposal to where it should be in the feature map, right? So let's come here and make it very clear. So we, we are here. We applied selective search on this image. So this is ROI is not like something very like this region of interest, right? So this is what ROI is. It's just a small abbreviation. So this is the proposal of selective search. Selective search proposes on the original image. What we do is we map this place or we map this uh, proposal into a location inside the feature map. OK? OK. Nice. Very, very, uh, very good question that you have asked. So the first step is, let's say, selective search on original image. Second step, original image goes through CNN and give you a feature map. Third step, the mapping SS proposals from original towards the map, towards the feature map. And then every single part in, of the feature maps uh, proposals will be sent through ROI pooling. And then will be sent for classification. So ROI pooling again, what is this? It's a very simple algorithm that takes any size and map it into a specific shape. Any size I want will always be mapped into the same uh, size. Very well. 
Thank you very much. <laughs> You're welcome. Thank you. So now we're going to do a small comparison between fast RCNN and RCNN. So this is RCNN. Now fast RCNN is much, much small, uh, faster, as you can see in training time, because we are not applying 2000 CNN passes. But it is still a little, a little bit uh, too lengthy. Now, if we look at this algorithm, so this is the uh, inference time, including region proposals, excluding region proposals. Now let's ignore RCNN and SPPNet. Let's look at the first RCNN one. Certainly, we can see, of course, that they are both much smaller than RCNN, so it's much faster than RCNN. But we can see that the uh, the biggest problem, or the only thing that is holding a fast RCNN uh, back is the region proposals algorithm. So the region proposals algorithm takes two seconds, whereas the whole part of the neural networks and classification take only 0 0.32 seconds. <laughs> True, it is much faster than RCNN, but still it could be improved. And now we know that there is no other way of improving this architecture besides fixing selective search. So we must fix selective search. And this is where faster RCNN came into existence. So faster RCNN is a very simple architecture. Here we have the fast RCNN model. So the same architecture of before, we just send the image once through the CNN, we have a feature map, and then we do the ROI pooling and stuff. But now instead of presenting or uh, instead of uh, finding the region proposals using selective search, we are finding it using region proposal neural network. So this is RPNs or region proposal network. It's a neural network that uh, proposes to us different regions inside the image. What it simply does, let's go for it. Let's yeah, bring it here, it's much better. Nice. Simply, it takes an image, send it through a CNN, and then through every single CNN, uh, through this, uh, this feature map that we have seen, it's going to do something similar to what we guys have pr uh, proposed before. So remember the sliding algorithm? Remember sliding the different, uh, like this? the different rectangles that we have proposed before. So this is what we're going to do. We're going to slide different anchors. This is what the anchors are. So you can see that there are different scales. First, there are the big scales, the medium scales, and then there are the smallest scales. And there are the rectangular objects. There are the horizontal objects, and then there are the vertical objects. So there are nine anchors in total. All of these anchors, are uh, centered around the same point. And basically, we are going to slide through the image with all of these anchors and do object classification. So this is the task. So the task is pretty huge, as you can see. But it's, uh, it's worth it. Why? Because it could be parallelized. Simply, what we do is we slide multiple windows through the image, so different uh, different anchors. As you can see, there's the rectangular, large, uh, horizontal, everything. So we have nine anchors, or let's say K anchors in this generic case. Slide them through the feature map, and then directly send them for classification. So what we do is we first classify whether there is an object or there is no object. So two thousand uh, two times K. So it's not 2,000, this is 2 times k. k is the number of anchors. And then, of course, we do this uh, region uh, or uh, what is it called? Uh, bounding box regression. So basically, we try to predict the correct coordinates of the object. And there you have it, right? So here we have 2 times 9 values for the output for classification. And here we have 4 times 9 values for the output of the uh, of the model 
Of course, as we said, we're going to send different sizes of these anchors. So this is what the uh, model would be doing. This is what RPN is doing. It sends the image through a uh, backbone, CNN. So let's call it VGG or anything, basically just some convolutional layers. And then gives you this feature map. The feature map, of course, is much smaller than the original image. So of course, sliding a window on this original image would take decades. But sliding an image on this feature map, or sliding a classifier, sorry, sliding a classifier on this feature map is much simpler. Of course, the sliding is going to happen one pixel by at a time, right? And if I do this, so I'm sliding only on this part, it is being mapped to this region of the image. If I'm working on this small part, in the image here in the feature map, I would be pretend, like the same thing as working on this part of the image. So this is the algorithm of region proposals. What it does, it simply looks at uh, the feature map. So, so it, takes an, it takes the whole image, send it through a CNN, find the feature map. And then from this feature map, it will slide a classifier not just one classifier, but K classifiers. For now, let's just look at the classification part. The regression part is simple, right? It slides K classifiers through the image and tries to predict whether on this part there is an object or not, right? Simple. Again, somebody would say this is very heavy, right? Because we have like CNN once, and then we are like sliding a classifier multiple times on the image. Yes, it is a lot if we do it sequentially, but remember we have GPUs now and you can do the whole operation at the same time. So it's definitely could be uh, speeding up much faster than say a selective search algorithm, which does not run on the GPU. So here we simply, as we said, slide the window of K anchors on the original, on the feature map, and this gives you our beautiful RPN architecture. So here's RPN. And here is past RCNN. So this is the previous architecture that we have spoken about. This is the CNN. This is the regions, let's say the selective, uh, like the areas that were given to us by selective search previously. Now they are given to us by RPN. What we do is we send them through ROI pooling. They all have the same size, send them through a couple of convolutional layers, send them for classification and for bounding box regression. Now, if we go back and look at how the, these regions are being generated, we see that they are being fed into our neural network through another neural network called RPN or region proposal network. The region proposal network also works in a very similar manner. What we have here is uh, an, a CNN that gives us a feature map. And on this feature map, we're going to apply our original basic idea for image classification, which is sliding a set of features or set of kernels like this, a set of anchors in, uh, in our terminology here of different sizes. Again, there's the sm small, medium, large, and then there is the horizontal, vertical, and uh, rectangular. And each one of these will be sent for classification and regression. Very basic, very simple. But this is just like a small recap of the whole family of RCNN. There is the RCNN architecture, which works with region proposals using selective search, and then uh, just basic classification through a CNN. Then there's the fast RCNN, which still does the region proposals using uh, fast uh, using selective search, but now it does the uh, pass over the CNN only once. So one pass over CNN, 2000 passes over CNN. And here we have the one pass over CNN, plus instead of having region proposal, we have an RPN, which is one pass over CNN and then sliding a set of classifiers on the feature map. 
Of course, there is an extension of these, uh, this one called mask RCNN, which works for segmentation, but we will not see it in this lecture. We will speak about it in the next lectures. So far, what we have seen is the following. So we have seen object detection. We have seen intersection of our union, non-maximum suppression, RCNNs, fast RCNNs, and faster RCNNs. Uh, we could go through this, but I really don't think we need enough time. I think, yeah, I think we could stop and finish this lecture another time. Uh, does anybody have any uh, account, uh, uh, any questions, I mean? No questions. Very well. So for the next, uh, what is it called? Uh, for the next uh, week, we're going to have our midterm. Please try to prepare very well for it. Try to revise it as, as good as possible. Try to do some applications of like the, the algorithms that we have done in the course. So try to do it by hand. So certainly there are going to be lots of questions there. And try to like uh, think about the edge cases of every uh, scenario, right? What would happen if this, what would happen if this? And uh, good luck, guys. Uh, after that, we'll have the next lecture. We will uh, kind of do a revision of this week's lecture and then finish the object detection lecture because I'm sure majority of you guys are not really focusing on, on the lecture and more worried about the midterm. And that's okay. So for now, thanks a lot for attending. Uh, have a great week and uh, speak, of course, with Karam. Try to understand uh, what are his uh, expectations, basically, for the uh, practical exam, right? So he will give you guys the practical exam, which will be kind of third of the midterm break overall. So thanks a lot and have a great week.